Good afternoon, everybody. Hi, I'm Jeff Goldberg, and for the last 18 months, I have been playing a terrorist by the name of David Coleman Headley, the forward planner of the Mumbai terror attacks of 2611. Let's begin with uh, what my connection with India happens to be. Well, I can happily say, after 10 years of living here, I still don't know um, what my connection with this country is, to be very honest with you. Uh, but one thing I can say for sure is that everything I've accomplished in the last 10 years uh, continues to impress me, even being here with all of you people here today. Um, I wake up each day and sort of have to pinch myself that I'm one of those few people who get to wake up and do what he loves for a living. Uh, well. Yeah, I, I really do. I got here in 2009 the first time, and when I came to India, of course, like everybody, I was smitten with the place, confused, of course, and I knew right away that this was just the energy and the type of place that I could thrive in, and I felt like I needed to be here. So those first few years here, I just kind of took a lay of the land living in Bombay, and uh, not much happened, well, well, not much creatively happened, although I did have a son uh, and set up a family, and I guess that's kind of what India's about, right? Family. Uh, so I got one of those. <laughs> Uh, and then in 2012, I moved back to New York, uh, where I had not lived in 15 years. And when I got back to New York, um, I was working in a variety of different institutes teaching the crafts of art and directing and film. But India um, just kept calling. And this time, literally, someone called. And they said, uh, Jeff, we want you to produce a play. Uh, so come on back. And of course, I was not sure that I wanted to move all the way back to India just for a play. But then they had the best sales pitch you'll ever hear as a creative person. You could do whatever you want. I said, whatever I want, and they said, whatever you want, and I said, well, I'm coming. <laughs> and uh, that's how I got here, and in the course of that play in 2013, I had the wonderful opportunity to work with some really talented actors, and in the process of working with those actors, I began to discover that actors in Mumbai and India at large are unbelievably talented, but they didn't possess the discipline of craft that maybe other parts of the world had had the benefit to experience, so I turned to my partner and the mother of my son, and I said, hey, you want to move back to India and start a studio? To which she unceremoniously said, no. <laughs> but uh, after a lot of conversation, we agreed that we would. And in January 2014, we started our studio with a bunch of really adventurous people who were willing to take a chance on us, and we took a chance on them. And once again, my connection with India became clear to me, which is it's about exploration. It's about doing something fun, and it's about doing something that's new and exciting. And that's kind of where it's been ever since. At the studio over the last several years, we've had the pleasure to produce a lot of theater and several films. And one of those projects that we got into pretty quickly was the David Coleman Headley Project. Now, the David Coleman Headley Project was something I had been researching since about 2012-13. Um, I became very interested in the topic because the events of 2611 are something when you're living in Mumbai, you can't really escape. And of course, you see the venues of where this terrible attack took place. So you're obviously immediately attracted to the story. And much to my surprise, I found out that the gentleman who planned the attacks, David Coleman Headley himself, was half American and half Pakistani. Now, of course, being a selfish artist as I am, I thought, ah, this is good. <laughs> um, which meant that finally I could play a role in 21st century Indian context and not be a British guy bonking Indians on the head before the independence of the country. And that attracted me. And then I began to research the topic. And as I did, something fascinating but very unusual happened. And that unusual fascinating thing was, as I came closer to the topic, I felt further away from it. It was the first time in my life that I had ever researched something and didn't feel like I was getting a handle on, on what I was learning. And actually, as I started to interview people about the David Coleman Headley uh, experience, including his own lawyer, Howard Leader in New York City, it became very clear to me that this topic and this individual and his life is something that is a bit of a mystery and very out of focus. But determined as I was, I spent the next five years researching it until finally my office at home was covered in photographs of 2611, murderers, terrorists, and a whole bunch of other really awful stuff to the point that my little son was not allowed in daddy's office because um, it was too scary for him. So there I was one day standing in front of this giant wall of material like a police investigation and I said to myself, I don't know what to do. And I said, Jeff, shelve this one. I don't know what to do. 
And I spent a lot of time thinking about it, but the truth was is that I had run out of room. There just wasn't enough landing strip. I didn't know what story to tell because there were so many stories. So I shelved it. And incidentally, in January 2008, a lover of the newspaper as I am, I picked up the news and tucked away somewhere inside the newspaper. It was a news item that broke my heart. I mean, you know, I'm that guy who cries at the news. <laughs> and it really broke my heart. What it said was that the United States Defense Department, the Pentagon, is now downgrading the war on terror from its top priority to the second tier. And now big world power, China, Russia, these things are gonna take precedent. And I thought, wait a second, 15 years ago, you marched us off to a war in Iraq that everybody knew was a disaster. And now you're gonna tuck this news item into the third page of the newspaper and tell us that the 15 years, tens of thousands of people that were killed, hundreds of thousands and millions that were displaced and an entire region of the world that has been literally devastated by this and we're just gonna reduce it to the second tier? I don't know, there was something about that that felt extremely dishonest, cowardly, and it bothered me. And then, as this new piece of information began to germinate within me, I was having a conversation with a colleague of mine one day, and he said to me, Jeff, what happened to David Coleman Headley? And I said, uh, well, it's still on my wall somewhere. And he said, do it. And then these two pieces of information came together, and then it hit me, like a ton of bricks. There was something about David's story and my story. David was a soldier in the war on terror where he was actually hurting people. But I had been a soldier in the war on terror as a peace, in the peace movement. I had marched in San Francisco, I had marched in Paris, I had marched wherever I could. And I thought, my frustration at this news item is crushing me. Imagine David Coleman Headley sitting in a United States federal prison for the next 35 years, how he must feel. Because no ground was won and so much was lost. The world wasn't a better place and we had fought a war to defeat an idea. I mean, it didn't take much to know that that wasn't gonna work, now did it? But suddenly, I had my angle into the story. Because you see, the thing is, when you play a complicated character like David, you do have to have a degree of empathy for him. Now let me be very clear, he is where he deserves to be, in prison. He committed those crimes, he is not a nice person. But when you start to approach a character, you have to recognize that there is something you share with them, regardless of what they've done, and that is humanity. And as a method actor, we work from this place called the inner life. The inner life being this emotional center that all of us share, every single one of us in the room. This piece of humanity that belongs to all of us. And this was the thing that I started to work on with David. And my research started to make sense because now I understood that there was an emotion he and I shared, frustration and anger. Anger at the same event, of course, on opposite sides of it, but just the same. We shared it, and that was undeniable to me. So I picked up my project and I began writing it again, and suddenly I got a phone call from home. As I was preparing the show, I received a phone call from my mother telling me she's about to have heart surgery, and I have to come immediately to New York without any thought in my head, booked my ticket, and I was on an airplane home. And then suddenly 35,000 feet above the earth between Mumbai and New York, David came into me again. I was sitting there reading the script, and something dawned on me about his research, something that I liked. It was a small little item that I picked up somewhere, which was David was very close with his mom, weirdly enough. No matter how sick or old she got, no matter where in the world he was, he dropped everything and was always with his mother when he needed to be. Well, I'm like that too. As a Jewish son, I think I'm doing a pretty good job. You'd have to check with my Jewish mother, but I think I'm doing okay. And suddenly it hit me that we shared this thing as well that there was something larger than our work, larger than our ideas, that grounded us. It was our mothers, it was the love of that we shared with our parents. So I got there to New York, my mother's heart surgery went well, thank God, and one day I remember I'm sitting there reading the script next to her when she's in her hospital bed, and I just, it dawns on me, how'd this happen? How did this one event in my life bring David Coleman Headley closer to me. And again, it hit me. It was about the humanity. And the role of the artist, and this is something that I've always said with all of my projects, is to have an opinion, 
I tell my students all the time, have an opinion. And in a world today where people are scared of opinions, you have to have one. It's now more than ever that we need the artist. Our job has never been to be famous or rich. We confuse success with these things like being on the page three of a newspaper. But the job of the artist is to talk about challenging, difficult, and dangerous ideas. It doesn't mean we have to agree. As a matter of fact, it's good when we don't. We start a debate, and that debate becomes part of our collective dialogue. And the biggest issue that I have worked on with David Coleman Headley over these years is this notion of collective memory. You know, we've just moved away past the 10th anniversary of the events of 2611, and we're forgetting. People are forgetting about what happened. They don't want to talk about it. And what's even more frightening is that this is not something that happened to your friend or your grandparent or is in the pages of history. It happened to everybody in this room, everybody in India today. We all know where we were, what we were doing, with whom we were speaking. And that collective memory is something we need to discuss. Now, I know it's hard and I know it's painful, but that doesn't make it invalid. And today, as the world becomes more and more polarized, and as politicians tell us to think this way or that way, or what we think isn't real, or what we feel isn't real, or what we even see isn't real, it is our job, the artists, to say no. It doesn't mean we're gonna be popular. It doesn't mean we're gonna be liked. But it means that we might be heard. And that is the job of the artist, to react, to respond, and to tell a story that unlocks something about your humanity. That's what we share, isn't it? We're all on the same blue ball, and the history of our planet belongs to every single one of us. It doesn't belong to one culture, one religion, one nation, one language. And the word that I think we keep losing every day as we allow ourselves to become more and more polarized and live in the echo chambers is humanity. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to just take a few minutes of more of your time and show you a piece of our show, David Coleman Headley. Uh, you will find now we are towards the end of the show and David begins to tell you how he planned the attacks of 2611. Ten men, five teams, two each have been chosen. They've been trained in Lashkar al Taiba training camps. The ISI, the Pakistani military intelligence, has given us a frogman because it's going to be a waterborne operation. These men are going to get into a boat in Karachi, sail to international waters. The plan is to find an Indian fishing vessel not looking, kill the crew, throw their bodies overboard, sail into Indian waters, right up to Mumbai. Now it's November. 2008, <laughs> a few days before 2611. The boys hop in a boat. They sail to international waters, but an Indian naval patrol catch them not looking. They turn around, make it back to Karachi, they nearly drown in the process. But the plan isn't abandoned. And now it's 2611. They hop into a boat, sail out of Karachi, enter in international waters, catch an Indian fishing vessel not looking, kill the crew, throw their bodies overboard, sail into Indian waters, right up to Cup Parade, amongst all the opulence and wealth of Mumbai in a slum. Ten men, five teams, two each, knapsacks full of AK-47s and grenades. They're gonna hunker down and hit the locations I've chosen. They fan out across the city, and I'm sitting at home in Lahore, Pakistan, when I receive a phone call from Sajid Mir in the command center. Turn on your television. We did it. 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 I did it. I did it. We did it. Look at it. Look at it! 
the Trident in Oberoi. They're picking who lives and dies. The Chabad house is awash with blood. Leopold has been a killing field in the Chakrapati station. The police's guns were so old they couldn't even fire. Dead bodies everywhere. And the Taj, the Taj Hotel, like a birthday cake, like a birthday cake, it burns. It burns for the world to see. And I did it. And I did it. 166 people die on the streets of Mumbai that day. And I did it. They catch Kassab. They interrogate him, but they don't know anything. The Americans failed India. India failed India. The Brits failed India. The Americans knew something was coming from the water. And they pulled the Taj Hotel. They beefed up security, but they weren't ready for the storm we were going to bring. The Indians didn't stand a chance. GCHQ, the Brits were listening live to the command center in Karachi. They had the codes to the sat phones, but they didn't give it to the Indians. And for three days, the Indians tried to break those phones. Meanwhile, the black hats were stuck on a tarmac in Delhi because they couldn't get a plane to get to Mumbai to save lives. And the whole world watched as the Taj burned. And I did it. I did it. You want to know who I am? You want to know who I am? Because I know who I am. I. I. I am David Bowman Medley. Don't you, or you, or you, forget it. Thank you very much. I promise I'm a really nice guy. I promise. All right. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much for your time. But um, before I go, everybody, I just want to say one thing. You know, today in this polarized world, we have to stop picking up the newspaper or watching the news and feeling like the person on the other side is against us. They may not agree with us, but that's okay. It's that debate and that challenge that we both share and that brings the conversation forward. And if the arts can do anything to respond to that, I assure you, I will be there. Thank you. <laughs>